And so we're, as you know, we're in this sermon uh, series that was supposed to be a sermon called The Real Spiritual War We Face Part 3, and I anticipate there will be a part four, I hate to tell you. And it's based on 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, and uh, I want to start by reading to you from a guy by the name of Andrew Claven. And in here, he's talking about our present situation in which we're living today, and I think it sets up for where we're trying to go in this series. This is what he says. The opposite of liberty is wokeness. Can anyone say amen to that? Yeah. It takes away your individuality and replaces it with group identity. It replaces equality of opportunity with equity, that is, equality of results. It utterly and obviously destroys your free speech. So fighting wokeness is the most important thing we can do right now. The country is on the line. In the journal, The American Mind, a publication of the Claremont Institute, which is a conservative think tank up here, most of the people in it think Clank are Christians, and he says, this week, two scholars have written an article in that journal called Anti-Woke Manifesto, and it's called Woke Revolutionaries versus Americanists. Because obviously, woke and America are opposites. And this is what they say, quote, National socialism, that is Nazism, and communism were the challenges of prior generations of Americans. Wokeism is the challenge of our generation. America is in the middle of a cold civil war between woke revolutionaries who believe America is and always has been systemically racist and evil to the core so that it must be deconstructed, delegitimized, and destroyed. Those who believe America is good and that its principles are the greatest antidote to racism ever created on the planet, and so preserving America and its principles are our highest and most urgent political calling of our time are attacked. And that's the end of his quote. Now he comments on this quote and says, now I believe they are absolutely right about this, but they are wrong about one thing. And that is, the woke people are not the revolutionaries. We are. The woke people already own the culture now. They own nearly every part of the culture. They own the businesses, they own the movies, they own the arts, they own the academics. They, are, they own just about everything. They are just solidifying their victory. Now that, we have won, now that they have won the victory, they are now bringing in the big guns, the real things that they're after and have been after all along. It's like when we let the Nazis take over France, and then the next thing we know, they're rounding up the Jews. So today, the woke are rounding up the Jews, so to speak, and the Jews are you and me. Anybody that disagrees with them. They are big business, and they are in the academy, and they are in the arts, and they are the big media, etc. We... We are the revolutionaries. We are the revolutionaries, and we need to fight like revolutionaries. And how do we do that? And this is the whole point that I wanted to bring to you today. I believe that we are in an inflection point. You have to accept that we live in a time of great moral evil, but you cannot fight it because it is in the souls of the people already. So you can't fight it by telling people they suck because they're not gonna believe you. <laughs> they don't know their souls are being stolen by Satan. And just like the woke people, the devil has convinced them that he does not exist. So if you start to talk about the devil, they'll say, you're nuts, you're crazy, that's not a real thing. So how do you fight back? There is only one way. You fight cultural rot with, you ready? cultural rebirth we are the cultural revolutionaries and we have to remake the culture and we do it by how we live our lives every day end quote is that awesome what's he saying he's saying the same thing that the bible's saying if you want to transform the culture you have to have not just a revival but an awakening in the culture there has to be the transformation of human hearts by the power of the gospel that is the essence the apex the most important part of spiritual warfare taking people from the kingdom of darkness and bringing them into the kingdom of light allowing god to transform their thoughts their emotions their desires their will their perspective their focus and their ambitions to align with his kingdom purposes in which there is no wokeness 
but only righteousness, truth, and justice. Amen? So he's saying the same. He actually happens to be a Christian. And so this is, is, you're saying, well, is it possible? Is this possible? Well, it goes right back into the methodology that we see in the book of Acts in chapter 17 and verse 6, where the Bible says this. And when they did not find Paul and Silas, so what had happened is Paul and Silas were going to the synagogue, as was their habit, and for three weeks they were debating all of the Jews as to whether Jesus of Nazareth was really the promised Messiah or not. And some of the people believed and other people didn't believe. And the people that didn't believe, what do they normally do? They try to cancel you. So they try to cancel Paul and Silas. So they send in the government. Of course, that's how you do it. So the government comes looking for Paul and Silas because they heard that they're troublemakers. Yeah, because they're preaching the gospel. They're troublemakers, right? And so when they did not find Paul and Silas, they dragged Jason and some of the brethren, that's other Christians, to the rulers of the city, crying out, quote, these Christians who have turned the world upside down have come here too. There it is. They even admit that the proclamation of the gospel and its transforming power in the hearts of individuals turns the world upside down, just as it was turning the culture of that city upside down. And that is what spiritual war is fundamentally, first and foremost, all about. So you don't have to go around looking for demons to shoot and beat up. You just need to know how we can win this war, sharing our faith and doing the things we need to do. And so our conflict, and this is my point by way of introduction, isn't primarily political, even though it'll involve that, it'll affect that, it affects all of life. It's not social, it's not even moral, it is spiritual. That's why it is called a spiritual war. Anyone see the Grammys? Yes. Are you confused now? They just made what we all suspected super obvious, correct? That's all. They're just saying it's in your face now. There it is. That's what we're doing. We're in a spiritual war. We worship Satan. You don't. We like child sacrifice. You don't. It's okay. We're, at least we know what we got. Amen? Ah, the truth will set you free, baby. So we, as we live in this culture, we wonder if we, the church, and sincere biblical Christians can succeed in our mission to help people find Christ and grow. And this is what Peter is talking about. In fact, if you go to verses 11 and 12 in chapter 2, he's kind of summarizing what he already said in the first 10, which hopefully we'll get through in the, this month. <laughs> Look what he says in verse 11. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers, you're aliens and strangers, why? Because this world is not our home. We belong to the kingdom of, of God. We live here presently, we occupy this space, but our allegiance is to the King Jesus and the kingdom of God and his will. That's why we pray every single day, or we should, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then we add the out caveat, uh, uh, the kingdom come in my life. As it is in heaven, thy will be done in my life as it is in heaven. So give us this day our daily bread, which tells you it's a daily prayer. You should be praying at least once a day. That's daily bread. Unless you don't want to eat, you can skip. I'm looking at a crowd that doesn't have that problem. So, <laughs> you all look healthy. Fit is a fiddle, all right? Let's continue. I don't want to get in trouble further than I already have. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against your soul. And those are the things he's talking about in the first couple of verses in this chapter. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. He's saying, I'm telling you all the stuff that I've told you so far, but you adjust your attitude and you start relying on the word of God to give you direction so that you will be able to live a life that glorifies God and leads people out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. That's what he's talking about. Does that make sense? So in this passage that's before us today, Peter tells us how the church can be effective in accomplishing God's purposes in the face of spiritual conflict, in the space of a spiritual war we find ourselves in. This same cosmic conflict that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And as we said before, there are five principles for spiritual success in the midst of the spiritually hostile environment. And it starts with an inside job. And we saw the last couple of weeks, it starts with dealing aggressively with your attitude. You get to pick your attitude every day. 
You get to decide if you're going to be joyful, if you're going to be kind, if you're going to be loving, if you're going to be uh, forgiving, if you're going to be uh, a gossiper of good things instead of bad, correct? Whether you're going to be honoring and respectful of those who are doing well, or you're going to be envious and, and treacherous about that. And you get to pick all that. That's what he's talking about in the first verse. Set your attitude on the right one. Well, which one? Well, where should I, how about this? So why don't we start with the attitudes that are manifestations of the Spirit of God and His control in your life? The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. That also means an, order, an, order, an orderly mind, orderly thinking. Each one of those you choose. You're going to choose to love this guy or not love him? You're going to choose to have peace or not have peace? If you say, I'm struggling with, pe- with lack of peace and, a- and, you know, I'm anxious, be anxious for nothing, but with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God, and he will what? What does it say? If you made known to God, the peace of God that surpasses all human comprehension will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You have the access. You have the tools. You've got to choose to use the tools, Right? And remember, the job's not done until the tool's put away. Some of you have to teach your high schooler when he borrows your tools. <laughs> so you deal aggressively with your attitude, verse 1. Number 2, you drink deeply from God's Word because it is God's Word that creates in us the habits necessary for spiritual impact and growth. And the desire for God's Word is a sign of spiritual health. Because it says, as newborn babies long for the pure milk of the Word that you may grow thereby, babies long for mama's milk. Have you noticed? You bring the baby home, what's it do? It yells. It wants something. I used to always tell Linda, the baby's yelling. Time to get her. Time to get the baby. I don't have the equipment necessary to take care of the needs of the child. God gave my wife that equipment. So I say, Lindy, and she goes, I know, I got it. And she goes and feeds the baby. Why? They long for the pure milk. Of mom, so they can grow. It's instinctive. Same thing with you and me. And when we do, we train ourselves in righteousness. We saw that last week. So today, we go to the third point, and it's found for us in verses four through eight. Let's pray and get into the details. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we're able to be together as a church family. We thank you for the love of Christ that is shed abroad in our hearts, even though we don't always reciprocate. And we thank you that it is by grace, through faith, that we receive every blessing that we have in our spiritual life. And so, Lord, we appeal to you now, through the ministry of your Holy Spirit, please teach us the meaning of your word and how it applies to our life today so we would be better equipped to win this spiritual battle that is really boils down to a battle for the souls of those who are lost in our environment and community. For I pray in Jesus' name, amen. So in verse 4 through 8, he gives us the next principle. The first one is that we want to deal seriously with our bad attitude. Secondly, we want to feed ourselves on God's word. Third, we want to draw life and strength from Christ. We want to draw life and strength from Christ. Verses 4 through 8. In verses 4 and 5, he says this. And coming to him, referring to Christ, as to a living stone rejected by men, but choice and precious in the sight of God, you also as living stone are being built up. There it is. Our foundation stone of our spiritual life, Jesus Christ, is creating smaller versions of himself. We are to take on the what? The image of Christ. He is producing the image of Christ in us. We're small representations of the big stone, the cornerstone Christ, right? And he is doing the building. We are being built up. This is his goal. This is his sovereign plan. He will accomplish it. He will accomplish it with our obedience, and he will accomplish it with his discipline when we are disobedient. But he will shape us into who he wants us to be. That's what he's talking about here. Is that making sense, guys? Now, here's what I want you to see. When he has this thing coming to him as a living stone, rejected by men, choice and precious in the sight of God, this is out of Isaiah chapter, I believe, chapter 28. And what it's talking about is that God has placed a foundation stone for his people upon which to build his kingdom in the future, but that stone will be rejected by men. Who's the stone? 
Jesus, the Messiah. They didn't know the name, so they would assume Messiah. But when the Messiah comes, he's going to be rejected by men. But now we have got a shot at it because the Jews rejected the Messiah. The offer of the Messiah to all mankind was made available. And so what they rejected became precious in our sight. Jesus references this phrase in the Gospels. Peter references this phrase, and the other apostles do, in the book of Acts. And now Peter in this book and Paul in Ephesians reference the same thing. In other words, this is something they learned personally from Jesus Christ. He is the cornerstone of the kingdom of God upon which God's future kingdom family will be built. And our job is to reflect the nature and character of that stone in our own life. And God is in the process of doing that. Our job is to draw strength and to draw encouragement and to draw life from that living stone. Is that making sense? You following me? I'm trying to get you a, uh, an actual exegetical understanding of what the text is actually saying, what God's word is actually saying here, and then make some uh, important deductions based on that. It said this, this stone was, was precious in the sight of God. In the Old Testament, it says that too. And you also are living stones being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ. This is what God's plan is. This is the first step in his plan now that we've done one. We've dealt with our attitude. Two, we're feasting on God's word. Three, we're cooperating with Christ, the cornerstone of the foundation of God's future kingdom people, of which is here already, we saw this last week, and not yet fully here. It's here, but not yet fully here. Already, not yet, okay? So here's the context. Christ can be depended on for us, We can depend on him because he is God's precious rock. It's foundation stone, if you like. Verse four, who is making us or building us into similar rocks that have his character. Verse five, we do this by going directly to God through Christ. He's the stone upon which we build. Is that making sense now? This is important. This means that the Lord Jesus Christ plays a unique and special and powerful role in our life like no other. And we need to understand what that is. So in Ephesians chapter two and verse 13, God's word says this, and I didn't give this to headquarters, so it's not gonna be on your screen, sorry. But you can write it down. It says, now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off, far off from God, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We were estranged from God. We did not have a relationship with God. God is holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty. We are sinner, 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 not very mighty at all, correct? So there's a gap between me and God. How do I transverse that gap? Well, I have to get rid of my sin, its guilt, its condemnation, and the only thing that does that is the blood of the Messiah. The Savior, that's why he's called the Messiah. And the Greek word for Messiah is Christos, and the English word is Christ. So Jesus of Nazareth is Christ the Messiah. When he shed his blood, it was a sacrificial payment to pay the penalty for my sin and yours, and all who ask God to apply that blood to our account. That's the salvation transaction. God is able to forgive me if I just ask him to, because Jesus already paid the price. Does that make sense? So you're really saying, put it on Jesus' tab, and God says, got it. That's why it's by God's grace. Could you make Jesus die for your sins? No, that was purely on his, that's grace, all God's grace. By faith, whose faith? Your faith. Believing that God loves you enough to send his son to die and to pay the penalty for your sin that if you actually asked him to forgive you for your sins, God would apply the blood of Christ to your account in heaven and you would be forgiven and saved and given the gift of eternal life. That is what faith is. I believe it to the point I act on it. So I say, Lord Jesus, come into my life, take away my sin, make me right with God, reconcile my relationship to the Father, send your son into my life to cause me to be born again. That's the full line. Now the words aren't magic, that's not what makes it happen. It is the heart that desires it. You want a shortcut way of doing it? If your heart's right, you simply change my rocky heart into a heart of flesh like Jeremiah talks about, Lord. Change me, cause me to be born again is a new creation, a child of God. 
I'm trusting what Jesus did. I don't have anything else to offer. I got nothing. I just want him. Is that making sense? Then five verses later, he says this. For through him, through Christ Jesus, we both have our access in one spirit to the, who do you think? Father. There it is. Because of our relationship to Jesus Christ, having paid the penalty for our sin through the Spirit, he applies the merits of Christ to our account when we exercise faith in Christ. And that gives us direct access to the Father. So now when you become a Christian, you can cry out, what's the word? Abba, Father. You don't have to say, hey, could you go talk to the Father for me? I got a few things I want you to like to say to him. And when you do, say hi to the Holy Spirit and Jesus too as you go by. No, there is no, there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. That's what the Bible says. So because of what Christ has done, we can go directly, directly to God the Father. Jesus even said that. He said, I don't even say you have to ask me. You can go directly to the Father yourself. In the Gospel of John, I remember I preached that sermon. Some people got mad, sent me notes. What do you mean? Yeah, well, Jesus said that. I didn't say it. He's, that's, you got direct access to God. Because of what Jesus did. Without what Jesus did, you don't. Well, can I pray to Jesus? Yes, you can pray to Jesus. Because when you pray to Jesus, you're praying to the Father and the Spirit anyways. Because the three are one and one are three. And you can't figure it out because of the Trinity. And no one understands the Trinity but God because it's a God thing. <laughs> Correct? But there's no secrets between them. So you can pray Jesus. But when Jesus said, here's how to pray, he said what? My, our Father, not uh, my Savior Jesus, who art in heaven. He said, say, my, our Father who aren't. So that's what we do. But you're not disqualified if you say, please, Jesus, right? Because he's one with the Father. So he'll communicate. Get it? Don't get lost in that. Or it's, just, it's a triangle. It just does this. But here's what I want you to see. We have access. And his point, the word both means what? All people. Because in the context, he's talking about Jews and non-Jews. So both. We all come to God the same way. There's no special inside track anymore. It's the same way. The merits of Christ provide the foundation for you to be able to ask God directly. And it is the Spirit of God that will actually apply the merits of Christ to your account in heaven. So that's why he says in verse 18, through Christ, we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So when you pray, you have direct access to who? The Father, right? That's, who, that which, that's what you have access to. How does this work? Now you go to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 23. Again, I didn't give to headquarters, so they, you have to trust me, I'm reading it correctly. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, he's using imagery, he's writing to the Hebrews, to the Jews, he's talking about the imagery, the heavenly temple imagery, and what he's saying is, since we have confidence to enter the holy, what is the holy? It's the holy of holies in Old Testament understanding. What is the holy of holies? It is the place inside the temple or the tabernacle where God's God manifested his glory. It was known as the Shekinah glory. And as they cruised through the wilderness and went into the promised land, this glory would be a giant flame at night that they could see. And during the day, it would be a fire of smoke, and they could see. And that would be emblematic of the presence of God. But no one could go in and check in on the, on the flame or the smoke, or you're struck dead immediately. But one day a year, the high priest, could go in if he has properly arranged the sacrifices required by the Levitical law to what? Sprinkle blood that would temporarily absolve the sins of the nation. We know it's temporary because they had to do it every year over and over and over again, which means it was never really satisfied. It was just put on a credit card until the guy that was going to pay the real bill showed up, and that's the Messiah. Making sense? And it says that in Hebrews chapter 10. The whole chapter says that, okay? So he's, re he's saying in this Holy of Holies. Now, the Holy of Holies was such a dramatic and dangerous place to be. Even if you were the high priest going on, going in, in on the right day, wearing the right clothing and bearing the right sacrifice, you might still screw it up. So you know what they did? They put bells on his sleeves and a rope around his ankle. Because if suddenly you heard a crashing bells and said, hey, Jerry, 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 no answer, you can just pull his corpse out. 
because you can't go in and get him. Get the idea? So this is a serious deal. And what the writer of Hebrews is saying, you have the privilege of going there without making all those arrangements. That's his point. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence, the word's boldness, to enter the holy place, the holy of holies, how? By the blood of Jesus, because of the sacrifice of Christ. It satisfied the holiness of God and his judgment against sin. Is Jesus Christ eternal? Yes. That would mean the sacrifice he offered is infinite in value, wouldn't it? Which means it can cover all the sins of all the people for all time, doesn't it? Which means there are no other necessary sacrifices. In fact, none other will be accepted. That's why Jesus is the only way. He's the only eternal one. Right? If he had a finite amount of, of merit to his blood, I would have used it up in my life because I'm an excellent sinner, and I'm sure you would compete heartily with me. But the point is, this holy place, we go in through the blood of Christ, the infinite sacrifice of Christ that has infinite value in the eyes of God, by a new and living way. The old was a dead way. Why? You brought the blood of a dead animal. This is a new one. You're alive. Christ is alive. He has risen. His, life has, his blood has living merit, Right? which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that's that veil that separates the holy place from the holy of holies, that is his flesh. Through the sacrifice of his flesh, we have entrance into the presence of God because the blood pays a penalty for our sins, verse 21. And since we have a great high priest, what's he called now? A great high priest over the house of God. Jesus is what? A great high priest priest over the house of God. Who is the house of God? All believers in Christ. Correct? Oh, I'll say it this way. All believers in the Messiah. So King David believed in the Messiah, just didn't know his name. He's in the house. Christians believe in the Messiah. We know his name, Jesus. We're in the house. As long as you believe in the Messiah, you get in the house. We're going to see this. Peter saying the same thing, but I want you to understand this passage in Hebrew is important. He says, since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. In other words, we didn't have any doubt. I can go directly to God. I'm fully assured that I can. Why? Because Christ has me covered. The blood of Christ paid the penalty for my sins, and the righteous merits of Christ were attributed to me the moment I believed. So I'm not just forgiven. Are you ready for this? I'm perfectly holy in God's eyes. In fact, I'm called, and every Christian is, a holy one in the New Testament. But because it's so startling, English translators of your New Testament don't like saying that. So they translate it saints, and everyone says, what's a saint? I don't know. Well, it's a holy one. Well, I say holy one. That confuses people. No, it doesn't. You call him a saint. It means it confuses people. They think it's a football team <laughs> or a marble statue or somebody did something nice for somebody one time. Wrong, 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 wrong. A saint is every single believer in Christ. They have the holiness of God imputed to them. You, you now have, in a sense, God's last name, Holy One, because you're in the family of God. This is, oh, well, it's, I, it's just, uh, I could just wrap it up here and just ramble. It, it, it's so powerful. It's kadosh in the Hebrew. Look at all the places in the Hebrew Bible where kadosh is mentioned. Those are the holy ones. They refer to what? Supernatural divine beings. Some of them angels and some even more powerful. And they sit in God's ruling council and they commune with God in deciding things. And we will one day sit at that council table with God because we're one of the holy ones. Oh, see why they just say saint and then you get confused and don't even notice. Anyways, enough of the translation conspiracies. Let's keep moving. He says, so since we have this great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is, what's that word? Faithful. He's faithful. God is faithful. God never lies. God makes a promise that if we receive Christ, 
We are cleansed by his blood. We are made holy and we have the right to enter in to the throne room of God with great boldness and assurance of faith that he is eager to hear us and will embrace us in love and not scold us from coming in. Isn't that awesome? That's why he says in chapter 4, come boldly to the throne of grace that you may receive mercy and find grace to help you in time of need. And I've said to you how many times, when's your greatest need? When you're most in need of mercy because your sin is so gigantic right now. That's your greatest hour of need. And he says, come boldly at that time. Why? Because you aren't accepted based on your behavior and you won't be rejected based on your behavior. You're accepted because of what Christ did for you and your faith and trust in that. That's what makes you come boldly. You have confidence. Jesus isn't lying. I get to come in. Yeah, I got a lot of dirt on me. That's why I'm here. I want to be cleansed. That's why I confess my sins and he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He who says he has no sin is a liar. That's the very next phrase. So in other words, you think, well, I don't have any. No, you're just delusional. <laughs> ask your husband, ask your wife, ask your child if you have any sin. They will give you a list. <laughs> right? And if you say you have no sin nature, you make God a liar and the truth is not in you. That's the next verse. No, we're liars. But we walk in the light when we admit that we're sinners and we experience the forgiveness of God. Is this making sense? So when you put this picture and this image, imagery together, who's your priest? Jesus Christ. He is our high priest. He's the guy we go to. He's our go-to guy. Correct? This is what we need to understand. So now let's go back to 1 Peter. And let's read what he said. And coming to him as a living stone rejected by men, but choice and precious in the sight of God, you also are living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. We just saw the spiritual house. Remember, I told you that. Right? For a holy priesthood. Ooh, holy and priests. Who's the high priest? Who are the other priests? All of us holy ones, all believers, all Christians. Making sense? We're the holy ones. And because we're the holy ones, we're a priesthood. Every Christian is a priest. That's what he's saying. And what do we do? To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. How? Through Jesus Christ. We offer up spiritual sacrifices in the power of the indwelling spirit in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, trusting his merits to give us access to God and offer these sacrifices to him. Is that awesome or what? All right, so if we understand that, there are three giant truths that he mentions, Peter mentions here in these verses four through eight. The first is this. We draw life from Christ in three ways or purposes. First is Christ's life in us is building us up. You also are being built up. It's happening. It's in process. It's ongoing. It's not start and stop, start and stop, start. No, it's going. You are in, God's, in process with God. He is building you up. He's constantly building you up, right? All things work together for good to those who are called of God, right? Love God and are called according to his purpose. What is the all good things? All things work together for good. What is that together for good? The good in that context, if you read on, is conformity to the character and image of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You're being built up into the little stone that God wants you to be. This small reflection of the big stone, the living stone, the cornerstone of the kingdom of God. That's what the good is. God is shaping you more and more to be like his son, Jesus Christ. That's the point of Romans 8, 28. And he does three things, he says. First, to be a spiritual community as a spiritual house. Remember, I just showed you that a minute ago. And then secondly, to be a ministering community for a holy priesthood. I already told you about what holy means. What is a priesthood? Well, we have a high priest who makes all the sacrifices. What all the other priests did? Well, if you went in the Old Testament and looked around, all the other priests did. They washed the animals. They fed them. They got them ready. They slaughtered them. They handed up. You know, they, lots of stuff for priests to do. But what, so I want to read you an article from John MacArthur on the priesthood. And this is what he says. Old Testament priests and New Testament believer priests share a number of characteristics. Now, why is this important? 
Peter is telling us that God has replaced the Old Testament priesthood with a New Testament priesthood. So we don't see priests in Old Testament terms anymore. We need to see them in New Testament terms because we are those priests. Does that make sense? Because you had to be born into a special family. You had to go through a special. You don't, you're reborn into God's family through faith in Christ and that you're done, right? So he says this. Number one, priesthood is an elected privilege. Exodus 28.1, John 15.16. Two, priests are cleansed of their sins. Same Old Testament, Le- Leviticus 8. New Testament, Titus 2.14. Three, priests are clothed for service. And we see this in a number of passages in the Old Testament and a number in the New Number four, priests are anointed for service. Leviticus, two different passages, and also in 1 John 2.20, which says what? You have an anointing from the Holy One, and you have no, one, have no need for someone to teach you, for the anointing teaches you all things. In other words, we have a special anointing, a special unction from the Holy Spirit, that with, we, with prayerful consideration of the Word of God, God promises that his spirit will teach us by illuminating our minds to understand the spiritual truth that are in the scripture so that you don't even need a teacher to teach you. You have the Holy Spirit to teach you. Now, he has gifted teachers and given them to the church so that they can accelerate that teaching process. They can aid you in teaching. But you can read the Bible under the influence of the Holy Spirit, and he will teach you what it means. Oh, so I don't have to have a Ph.D., no Greek and Hebrew to study my Bible? No. So you have no excuse for not reading it. (laughs) Then he says this, priests are prepared for service. You have to prepare yourself, it says in 1 Timothy 3, 6. Priests are ordained to be obedient. In other words, God asks obedience from us. Priests are to honor the word of God. Yes, we are. We just saw that in 1 Peter 2. Priests are to walk with God. We see that in Galatians 5, 16. Priests are to impact sinners, Galatians 6, 1. And priests are messengers of God. These are the top 10. The main privilege of the priest, however, is direct access to God. End quote from Mr. MacArthur. What's his point? All Christians are new covenant priests. They are a holy priesthood. That's why Christ gives spiritual gifts to all believers. You get a supernatural divine enablement to do Things in the spiritual realm that no one else can do like you. It's a spiritual gift uniquely attached to who you are when you're born again into the kingdom of God. And if you don't use your gift, our kingdom suffers. And if you do use your gift, you make a difference for all eternity. Is that exciting? It's pretty awesome. And so it is The reason that we have this gift is so we can do ministry in the name of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 puts it this way. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit. That's the spiritual gift. For the common good. Now, some of these spiritual gifts appear to be mundane, but they're not. They're supernatural in nature, even though they have a mundane name, like the gift of administration. The ability to what? To organize a church so that it can move effectively in accomplishing the purposes of God. That's a spiritual gift that God gives to certain people in the church. Our church administrator has that gift. And that's why we're doing well. When I tried to do it, things weren't so smooth. <laughs> right? Because it's a spiritual gift. Does that make any sense? Spiritual gifts have spiritual impact and create spiritual results because they're supernaturally empowered by God. And it's for the common good. So let's say you have the gift of giving, which is another one listed in the New Testament as a spiritual gift, that you give your money generously and extraordinarily. Every Christian is to give something to God as an an, uh, offering of thanksgiving to God. But some believers just love just throwing tons of money into God's work. You ever seen guys like that? You go, wow, these guys, one guy lives on 10% and gives 90. Awesome. He has the gift of giving. What if he said, I have the gift of giving, I'm going to spend it on me. This doesn't seem like the right use of the gift, does it? That's why he said the manifestation of the Spirit is for the common good. Whatever your gift is, it is for the purpose of building up the kingdom of God, not building yourself up. You will receive joy, but that is a byproduct, not the goal of using the gift. Is that making sense? I say this because some Christians get selfish with the gift that they have, and they use it on themselves almost exclusively, and the church doesn't really benefit. And by church, I mean the kingdom of God in general. You want to use your gift for the kingdom of God. It has eternal impact that way. 
And now here's the next thing I want to say about it, because I think I'm actually not long. I'm still okay. All right. Uh, <clears throat> the third phrase is super important. We have this gift, we have this empowerment, we have this position, we have this calling, we have this priesthood that we're a part of. Now, he's, what do you do with it? To be a worshiping community. That's what we're doing. He says, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Well, spiritual sacrifices mean God-honoring works done because of Christ. In other words, his merits gives us access into the family and into this privilege. Under the direction of the Holy Spirit, it's empowered by the Holy Spirit, and the guidance of God's Word. These include, and I've listed uh, seven of them, offering the strength of your physical body to do physical labor to advance the kingdom of God. That's Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Number two, praising God. That's Hebrews 13, 15. Number three, doing good works. Number four, sharing one's resources. Number five, bringing people to faith in Christ. Number six, sacrificing one's own desires for the good of others. Ephesians 5, 2. And here's, a spirit, here, here's another sacrifice you can make. You ready? Praying for others. Praying for others is a spiritual sacrifice that a priest of God can make on behalf of others. Isn't that cool? Is that exciting? Okay, so what does this priest look like? What is this priesthood? I have this research article. I'm going to think, uh, I'm going to, oh, no, no, no. Uh, those are some other things. No, I, this is the right deal. It's just I don't know if I have enough time to read it all. All right, do you want me to read this? It's, it's, a, it's a summary of a journal article on the priesthood in the New Testament. You, okay? I hope you'll find this fascinating. I did. Here we go. The conception of the Christian priesthood never in the New Testament attaches itself merely to the ministry of the Christian church. In other words, there's no such thing as official formal priests in a Christian church, according to the New Testament. Don't tell your Catholic friends that. It'll scare them. <laughs> Whatever may be held as to its orders or tasks, the church has orders and tasks that it has to fulfill, but priesthood is not one of them because everyone is a priest. In no sense has the church or any church an official priesthood, nor is it any part of the New Testament conception of the priesthood of believers that any individual should act in any respect for another. In other words, you can't go to God for me necessarily, right? Though the intercessory supplication of believers on behalf of other persons has of late often been represented as a priestly act, as being indeed that activity which is essential to any real priesthood of believers, the New Testament thought is quite different and is to be thus conceived. It's a long kind of scholarly phrase that says this. It says, when you pray for others, yes, that's a priestly act, but it's not attached to the office of priest because there is no office of priest in the New Testament church, contrary to the Orthodox and the Roman Catholics and some bishops from other church, the Church of England, etc. okay? These are artificial offices created by these religious organizations. It's not part of the New Testament. Continues. In ancient times, it was held that men in general could not have a direct access to God, that any approach to God must be mediated by some member of the class of priests. Yeah, that's what the priesthood was for who alone could approach God and who must accordingly be employed by other men to represent them before God. The whole conception vanishes in the light of Christianity, but that's no longer necessary because we're Christians now. And we have what? Direct access to God. We don't have to go to somebody else to get to God. We can go straight to God because our high priest has made it available. By virtue of their relationship to Christ, all believers have direct approach to God and consequently as this right of approach was formerly a priestly privilege, the sons of Aaron in the Old Testament, right? Priesthood may now be predicated of every Christian. In other words, every Christian is part of the priesthood of God. That's what First Peter is telling us. That none needs another to intervene between his soul and God. That none can thus intervene on behalf of another. That every soul may and must stand for itself in personal relation with God. Such are the simple elements of the New Testament doctrine of the priesthood of all believers. The priesthood springs out of the deepest need of the human soul. Men usually feel... Oh, excuse me, universally feel that somehow they have 
offended, offended the power to whom they are responsible, to whom they must give an account of their deeds. They long to appease their offended Lord, and they believe that one who is authorized and qualified to act in their behalf may secure for them the abrogation of penalty and the pardon they seek. Hence, priesthood connects itself most closely with sin, with guilt, and with its removal. The heart craves the intervention and the intercession on their behalf of one who has liberty of access to God and whose ministry is acceptable. In short, the priest is the representative of the sinner in things pertaining to God. He is the mediator whose office it is to meet and satisfy the claims of God upon those for whom he acts and who he secures the pardon and the favor which the offender must have if he is to enjoy fellowship with God. And this... And more than this, we have in our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Amen. That's it. We go to Jesus. He makes everything new. I don't go to some man wearing a, a bathrobe. No offense to the guy. But he's standing between me and God, and he does not have that right. There's one that stands between me and God and has laid his blood on the line for me, and his name is our Lord Jesus Christ. Glory, hallelujah, amen, and let's pray and get out of here. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus is our Lord and King and High Priest. We thank you that because of his sacrifice, we can come boldly, directly into the throne room, the throne of grace, to receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We thank you that you love us because of what Christ has done for us and have accepted us into your family so that we may have this incredible privilege of having a relationship directly with you, independent of any other human being, and that you hear our prayers and the cry of our heart. Lord, we pray that you would fill us with your spirit and that you would strengthen us with might in our inner man, that Christ may abide in our faith, in our hearts through faith, and by so doing, we would be rooted and grounded in your love, drawing strength and security and nourishment from our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and that we might know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, and that we might understand what is the height, the width, the breadth, and the depth of the love of Christ, and that we might be filled up to all the fullness of God because of our relationship to your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, for we know that you are able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we could ever ask or think according to your riches and glory in our savior jesus christ amen